If you are visiting with us and you would like to receive the email as well, just kind of nudge the person to your left or to your right. They can forward that along to you. Uh, that just enables you, one, to kind of follow along a little bit easier. As well as two, is you get to go back and build your own convictions. You get to go back, kind of reflect on the word of God that you heard today, and really build your own strength and your own faith. Come on. Um, you know, have you ever heard that people are always talking about that there are always two types of people in the world? Oh, two types? Right, and they, they, they come up with all these different things. They'll say, hey, there's either you're a winner or you're a loser. Oh, that's true. Either, either you're a person who's, who's a quitter or you persevere. Right? And they talk about either you're, you're a dog person or you're a cat person. Oh, yeah. Wow. And throughout this, you hear this, that there's only two types of people, but there's like hundreds of two types of people. <laughs> right? It's like, what? That doesn't really make much sense. But there's one that I, I, I kind of have to say that I'm on one side. They'll either say, you like watching Friends or you like watching Seinfeld. I'm on Friends. Oh, yeah, that, that literally Friends. splits a group right there. <laughs> and I have to confess... I'm a Seinfeld no. person. I, I, I do not like Friends. What? There's just something about Friends that I don't like. And autom automatically, people want to change their seats. You know, when you, when you start preaching things like this. But I do have to say, why do people like Friends? Excuse me? I understand about it. Is people like that type of show because they get to see kind of different friends in their life. They can say, you're, you're a Chandler. Yeah. You're a Joey. I don't know all the names. Those are the only two I know. So, you know, you're, you're a Rachel, whatever they are, right? That, that's why they like it. Because they're like, hey, they can watch the show and kind of look at people in their friendship group or in their family and say, well, that's that person, that's that person. And to be honest, Jesus is kind of like this. Whenever Jesus actually preaches in the parables that we see, we see that it's not just going to split the group. There's going to be two types of group. Yes, there's going to be those who accept his word and those that don't. But kind of like friends, there's going to be a lot of different characters or individuals that kind of show us who we are as well. Yeah. And so today we're going to be reading one of Jesus' stories here. And we're going to see a lot of different people displayed in this story. But the main question, kind of like friends, are you a Joey? Are you a Rachel? The same question is going to be proposed to us today is who are you in Jesus' story? So my title of my lesson this morning is who are you? Point number one is the watching crowd. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1 through 2. Come on, Sean. It says here, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such a large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So we'll just stop here for a moment and kind of understand what's going on in this story so far. So before this, we know we're in Mark chapter 2, but that means, okay, one whole chapter has already gone by. What has gone by? What has happened? Well, Jesus' ministry has already started by this point. The good news of the kingdom of God being near has already been preached. Jesus has already started to heal people. Jesus has already called his first disciples, and he started to wander around and actually preach this word. And a couple other things have also happened. So with this starting and Jesus coming in where he is now, the word has spread fast that Jesus was becoming a somebody. Mm. That Jesus' name was now starting to get into the mainstream, uh, you know, the, the mainstream, and people were starting to hear this name, Jesus. And it got to the point where actually in Mark chapter 1, that it says that everyone was looking for him, so that's where he had to go find a solitary place to go and pray. Mm. That, that the ministry started to pick up quick. But now we get here in verse... One in Mark chapter 2, that now he's back home and people are curious. That they were coming to hear what he had to say, but we're going to later find out that they just wanted to listen. They didn't really want to see what others, what other people saw in him. They just wanted to hear, what was he, I wanna, I'm curious, what does he have to say? But they didn't really want to actually follow Jesus at this moment. See, many people are curious to find out about the Savior, but they avoid the commitment to a Savior. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus at this point, he was extremely entertaining. He, he was an entertaining person. You know, and, and it's one of those things, have you ever listened to a song that it's not very good for you, but it's hard to get out of your mind? Yeah. Man, those songs suck, <laughs> right? You know this isn't good, but that was almost kind of like Jesus at this point, that these people, not that he was a bad song or anything like that, but he was bad for them. 
Because Jesus was saying things that were on their heart, but they didn't want to remember it. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want, to, they didn't want any of that. But Jesus, when they went out to him, he was, he was super entertaining. Why? People came to him and he would heal people. He had amazing sermons. Awesome things were happening around him. They get to see other people's lives change and say, well, that's pretty cool. And the same thing, though, like that he didn't really come there. That wasn't his purpose, though. Jesus did not go to entertain. He, he went to change. Very different purposes. See, he never gave a political speech. His intention was never to rally a mob through motivation. He came to speak the truth, and the truth always divides. Always divides. In Luke chapter 12, verse 51, it says, do you think this is Jesus speaking? Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. And he goes on talking about how he's actually going to divide even households. Because some are going to want to follow him and others aren't. And we learn that, wow, there is nothing sharper than the truth. Nothing cuts just like it. That even when you don't want to feel that pain, that, that, that still cuts right there. Yeah. But even though Jesus is starting to preach these messages, the word's getting out, even though the, the truth is extremely sharp, people still walked away uncut. Mm -hmm. well, how is that possible? Well, we, we get reminded of these verses in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. It says, this is what I've spoken to you in parables. Those seeing it, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. That Jesus was speaking the truth that was supposed to cut their lives, but yet they were still walking away uncut because they didn't really want to hear what Jesus was saying. Wow. They came in and just wanted to hear, just kind of please their ears, but not and, and keep that word away from their heart. Mm -hmm. And so you see this crowd have all these different responses to God's word. Have you ever went to the movie with a friend and they loved it, but you hated it? And you kind of walk out, that person's so excited, it's awesome and everything. You walk out, you're like, man, did we watch the same movie? <laughs> like, man, you should have seen when this happened. That was just like, you know, it was supposed to symbolize my mom. I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? It's like, what, what movie did you watch? It's the same thing when you actually go and hear the words of God. People say, hey, it never returns in vain. Well, yeah, that's true with the open heart. Wow. Those that have closed their heart to God, nothing's happening. There is fruitless. Because the seed can't get in. It's the same thing there, is that when people come to church, people can come because sometimes it's quite entertaining. Church is entertaining. It's cool. You get uh, free bread and a little bit of juice. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of fun, right? You get to hear some cool songs. That's nice. It's fun watching people jump around and everything. You get to hopefully hear a good speech. You know, those things are entertaining things. But that's, that's not why we're here today. We're not here coming to entertain. We're here to change. Come on, come on, bro. See, a crowd had come to Jesus to hear what he had to say. But many of them, their journey would end traveling with the Messiah would end there. Yeah. It, it'd be done. They would come to that house and that would be the end of the story. In the same way, we can see many people come and go from the church. They find it entertaining. But they did not come to change. See, so many people can come to witness a show instead of worship the Savior. Mm -hmm. People can come to show up to watch, but not show up to work. Mm -hmm. See, don't just, excuse me, um, don't just attempt just to witness or watch the move of God, but get to work and become the movement of God. Come on. See, the very first thing is looking at this, this story of Jesus, you can be this. Are you being the watchful crowd? That you've come here because it was a fun thing. It was a cool thing this morning to come along to church. Are you actually coming here to change your heart? My first challenge is do not just come to church and listen to the sermons. See what's going on and just, oh, that, that was cool. That was nice. I'll go and now live my life. That was just a bit of my morning. It's, it's, it's change from today. Come on, bro. I want you to walk away, not me putting on your heart what you need. I want you to walk away and write down one thing you personally need to change. Yeah. Take ownership of your life. Mm -hmm. Take ownership of what you hear. Because in the same way, I'm preaching this, and I have an intention of what I want you to get. But it's kind of funny. Every single time I ask somebody, hey, what did you get from my sermon? They're like all the way out of left field. I don't know. <laughs> you know they're like, 
you know, when you say, uh, are you a cat or a dog person, that, oh, that hit my heart. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but but uh, take what you get out of it. Amen. If that's what God wanted you to hear this morning, be a cat person. I don't know. But, but change something in your life. Point number two is the weary crippled. So just like a movie, have you ever watched a movie? And you had to watch it over and over and that you realized you missed so many things the first time you watched it. Yeah. I know I don't know when the Matrix actually came out. I think it was 1991. Something around there. Uh, 1999. Okay. But um, so I was born in 1993, so I was seven, eight years old about when I first watched it. And The Matrix is actually quite a deep movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the only reason I watched it was for the fight scenes. Yeah. And that's the only thing anybody ever talked about the Matrix, right? You just talk about Wow, you did the Matrix. That, that's all everybody cared about. And it wasn't until later on in life I watched it again. I'm like, well, this movie's deep. You know? And if you don't know the movie, it's, uh, it's hard to come in. Go <laughs> <laughs> no, watch it. Uh, but it's actually, quote unquote, based off the Bible. Interesting right. enough. But it's one of those things. It's like, you, you, you have to go and look at, now, what did I miss? Yeah. And it's the same thing with this crowd. that They missed something right. when they were going to hear Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verse 3. Some men, some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. See, we, we hear in, in verse 3, yes, a lot were coming to Jesus, but only a few were actually having on their mind and their focus on Jesus' purpose. Everyone else, all they brought were themselves, but these people brought something different. You know they missed the purpose of Jesus when they walked past someone that was needing him more than them. Amen. See, while there is people fighting for the best seats of the house, there is a man outside fighting for his life. Wow. And they missed it. See, I wonder how many people in the watchful crowd walked past, uh, past this man in need. That, just so that they can get their seat in, with Jesus. Oh my God. Some must have been com com completely focused on themselves. I just gotta, I gotta hear the word. So anybody else, they gotta, they gotta focus on themselves. Wow. And others would have purposely, you know, avoided the eye contact. Like they know I should have done that, but but I didn't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting. Um, this person, he went around and kind of interviewing homeless people, and when asked, hey, what what do you need the most? Most of them, one particularly said, eye contact. I don't need food, I don't need shelter, I need people to look at me. Wow. And what happens is in society, because they kind of put on their hearts, well, if I look at them, then I have to acknowledge them. So they don't have any money in their pockets, so that I don't want to feel guilty, so they, they always look away. And so these homeless people, they would kind of describe, it's like, I don't even know if I exist. Wow. It's, like, it's like a wasteland. People just do not even look at me. And I, I wonder if this man felt the same way. You know, that, that people were coming to Jesus, but they totally missed why you should be going there anyways. Mm -hmm. If you're going there, amen, it's going there to change or to change someone else. Yeah. Those are the two reasons you should be going. Yeah. See, maybe this man wasn't just outside the house. We don't really get that from the text. Amen. Then that means something even different. Perhaps they carried him from afar. That's even more commitment there. Yeah. If he wasn't just outside the house, just hanging around, amen, they, they, they went the extra mile to bring him all the way to this house. Yeah. But we have to see that, well, he wasn't the only person, right? He wasn't the only cripple in Israel. That there was, again, so many other people that needed him, that needed Jesus, excuse me. See, the very first thing we have to see, we, we cannot be a Jesus church if we come to church with please us mentality. Come on, Sean. The watching crowd then can be kind of like the church harper, the church hoppers today. And what it is, it's this thing that's come into Christianity where people are now attending churches. What, well, I have to find a church that fits my needs. Mm -hmm. I need to go to a church that's going to give me what I need. Instead of going there is how can I better this church? Wow. How can I, well, I, I've seen some problems. I'm, maybe God sent me here to fix these things. Come on, John. There, there, there's not that anymore. There's these church harpers. It's like, well, hey, I have to go jump around a couple of times and then, if, if, if I find one that meets my needs, then I'll go to it. Mm -hmm. now, that was a watchful crowd right here. That they were not going with the purpose of God. And because of this, churches have now literally become, they started to adapt into this culture, mm -hmm. where they have literally become a service. 
not meaning like a church service. It's more of like a function not to serve the, the needy, but now to serve the, the selfish. Wow. Where churches, it's almost now becoming like a business where they're trying to persuade people to stay. Come on. They come in and they're like, well, how best can we get these people to stay? They're hopping around. Well, how can I serve them and, 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 and get them and persuade them to stay? Instead of just preaching the truth, and it's going to divide the crowd, and whoever's left, that's who we have to serve. There's a huge difference to what Jesus did and what people are doing today. And so it gets us going back into, okay, are we part of this watchful, watchful crowd? Well, we got to go back to, well, why have we come? And what did we bring? Those are the two things we have to ask ourselves. Why did we come? Well, if it's to change ourselves, amen. But of what did we bring? And we cannot grow dull to the plight and pleads of the world around us. Who, who did we walk by this morning that, that needed God? Were we just so focused on, on getting our parking spot or getting here early, making sure our, our tie is straight and our, our shirts are ironed? Who, who did we walk by? And I guess the question that we have to really ask ourselves is, do you see people? Meaning not just what they want you to see, but truly who they are. Yeah. Because have you ever tried to hide something from other people in your life that is completely obvious to everyone? Yeah. Right. We try and hide our true selves. And it's the same thing with people that we interact with. That they'll tell you, I don't need it, I don't need it. But, but you've got to dig down deep. Do you really care for these people to ask the difficult questions? Sometimes people just answering fine or I'm okay is just, is just another way of saying, ask me another question. That's all it is. Ask me one more time. And maybe you even feel that where you don't want people to dig deeper in your life. We can always talk about in the church, hey, are we sharing our faith? But what about loving the lost? Yeah. Come on, Sean. Two completely different things. Yeah. Two completely different things. Do you, excuse me, do you care enough to dig down deep into the people in your life? See, maybe this cripple, he may have even insisted that he didn't need to go. The guys would have showed up like, hey, Jesus is not that far away. Do you want us to carry you? No, it's okay. I've been crippled my whole life. It's okay. I don't need it. No, no, no. No, no you need it. So you got, no, it's too much hassle. Don't worry about it. That's too hard for you guys. No, you don't understand. This can change your life. All right, you grab one corner, you grab another. Let's go. Come on, Sean. There, there would have been this forcefulness to get them to Jesus. See, the very first question we have to ask in my challenge is, guys, who, who are we bringing to church that needs God? Yeah. It's not about just what we need, but we're coming here to help change others as well. Yeah. Do not forget, so in our church, uh, for those that are visiting, we're having a Christmas service next week. Yeah. And uh, we've been super excited, inviting everybody. It's going to be awesome. We're going to be seeing Christmas carols. Um, we're going to be having a, a lunch together as everybody in the congregation. We're all bringing food. We're going to have a toy drive that we're giving away. It, it, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be an awesome time of fellowship and family. But the thing is, we've been going around and sharing our faith and bringing people. That's one thing. But do not forget, guys, that, that for some people in Auckland, this may be the only Christmas that they will have this year. We've got we to remember the deep things. It's not just going to be a fun service. It's going to be meaningful to these people. Yeah. This may be the only Christmas where their family's not yelling at each other. This may be the only Christmas without conflict. We've got to dig deep and get people to come because because it, it, it's for them, not just for so that we can say, oh, we had an awesome, we had awesome visitors and a lot of people came. That's nothing about us. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with them. Yeah. See, my point number two in the challenge is dig down deep with the people in your life. Oh, Fulfill those needs. Point number three is the willing companions. Oh, you know, just a shout out there. What do you think are the best love stories? We'll, we'll, we've been kind of holding on the theme of movies. Just to, uh, you guys can't answer. What are the best love stories in movies? Titanic. Titanic? Okay, that's pretty good. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. Okay. Frozen. Well, Frozen, okay. The Notebook, okay. Uh, sisters, you know, love it. Uh, no, not Jesus. <laughs> what, what, what do you think are the best love stories in the Bible? Now, don't just cheat and go to Jesus. Uh, what are the best love stories in the Bible? Ruth and Naomi. Ruth and Naomi, okay. Nabal had a good wife. Who? Nabal. Nabal? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. Isaac and Rachel. Isaac and Rachel, okay. Some pretty cool love stories. I want to convince you, this is one of the best love stories I've ever read. In verse 3 and 4 it says, Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowering the man, excuse me, the mat the man was lying on. Wow. I, I, I really love reading this story. And I'm convinced that this is one of the greatest love stories in the Bible. Because we read here that we don't know if they were just carrying a friend or a stranger to Jesus. Yeah. But that is love right there. They brought this man from far. That would have took a lot of sweat, some hurting, some pain. And they got to the door and they said, hey, well, we can't make it here. Let's go to the roof. Well, what do we do on the roof? This was kind of a bad idea. Okay, let's do it. Like, they started breaking down the door. Like, that, that's love right there. Yeah. That's selflessness because they had nothing to gain from it. Yeah. If this was a complete stranger, there was, there was nothing to gain. Not a single thing. This wasn't an easy task. Some of us can be, even be reluctant when we have the easier route. Meaning, to bring somebody to church, we're like, oh, wow, well, i got to drive them. What about petrol money, um, traffic, parking? Oh, some of us struggle with those type of things. So, you know, they wouldn't have had gloves. The mat wouldn't have had easy-to-carry handles. It, it would have been difficult. You know, they, they would have had, they would have had to um, miss out on the best seats in the house. They weren't a part of the crowd. They couldn't hear Jesus' lesson. They had to sacrifice to get this man yeah. to his blessing. Uh -huh. yeah. See, sometimes, guys, we need to be these companions. Yes. Sometimes those who need Jesus don't need to just hear that the end is near. Yeah. Instead, uh -huh. they need to hear that a friend is near. Uh -huh. They need help. And sometimes we can... We can misunderstand and expect that the spiritually crippled need to bring themselves to Jesus. Hey, you get up. You walk to church. You start praying. You start reading. We don't understand that they're, they're spiritually crippled. Yeah. And we get mad at them because they're not, they're not walking. They're not moving. But yet, we don't understand that, that, that we have to recognize what spiritually crippled means. Well, how do you recognize when someone's spiritually crippled? But first, we need to understand that there's a difference between someone refusing to walk and someone who is spiritually crippled, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's a difference between those two. Like in reality, though, you can either be born crippled or made crippled. And I believe that's the same thing with people who have become spiritually crippled as well. You can be crippled by circumstance, by others, or even by yourself. So those who don't want to walk, to be honest, nothing can really be done with. Have you ever heard of that? That you can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink? Yeah. Well, man, if you can't even lead the horse to the water, like, what, what else can you do, right? Like, if you can't even get to step one, amen. Those are the people that maybe they, they've gone through the usefulness of the Bible. They've been taught. They've been rebuked. They've been correct. They've been trained. And they still refuse to do it. Well, amen. Something, God needs to do something in their heart for their heart to really change. Yeah. But what does it mean for those who have been born spiritually crippled? Well, maybe for those that have actually never learned how to pray. Those that, what does it mean to be born crippled in, 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 um, you know, in reality? It means like, okay, I never knew how to walk. It's the same thing. I never know how to walk with Jesus. Okay, we can't get mad at those guys. Yeah. we got to help train them, help them walk, get them, get them to start doing it. Yeah. Um, those who have been born crippled, again, we have to teach them how to do it and call them higher to do it. Those who have been made crippled, these are the type of people that have been spiritually hurt. Sometimes they've been hurt by others, or they've been hurt by their own wrongdoing. And we have to get them to break away from what most people, when they're, in, when they're hurt like this, that they can do and be tempted to do. That sometimes these people will just spend the rest of their life pointing at other people and blaming other things of why they're now crippled. Well, my relationship with God isn't that good because of the people around me. Or I went to this one church and, and the pastor did something wrong and now my relationship with God is... And it, yes, you're, you're hurt. I get that. And I'm sorry someone's hurt you. But you've got to make a decision in your life to get up. Come on, John. I mean, we've got to help these people, whether they've been crippled by somebody else or were crippled by, some, by, by them own selves. We've got to help them. Get, guys, you can't walk. We've got
got to bring them to Jesus. Yeah. And the thing is that we have to learn and understand that it's not easy learning a new thing. Or for them, for other people, it's not easy learning an old thing either. To do it again and get your heart soft again and to give again when it's been hurt, that's, that's not going to be an easy thing to do. But we read here that the companions were the ones who took up the pain. Yeah. It was not the spiritually crippled. Mm -hmm. That we need to be willing to take up the pain while they receive the blessing. Mm -hmm. that, that's a sacrifice of these companions. See, those that carried the map um, got nothing. They, they didn't get anything from their work. Um, but were the ones who, you know, excuse me, the ones that carried the map didn't get anything from them. They're the ones who did all the work. But something we always have to remember, if that's the thing that we are being called to do, remember that someone carried the corner of your mat one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to always remember that. I know when I was a young man uh, coming into the church and becoming a Christian, one of the spiritual, I don't know what you want to call it, I, I, the way that I was crippled is that I never had a healthy relationship with an older man. Uh, my father passed away when I was two. And my older brother was kind of finding his own identity and doing the own thing. And at a young age, being the youngest of six, I was almost like looked at to be the next successor. You know, everyone always looked at me that I got to be the man. I got to be the one that's going to be succeeding. And so when I came to the church, I, I really found it difficult to open up my heart to older men. It, it, was, it was a life that I was crippled with. I just, I just couldn't do it. I just could not give my heart to others. And so many people I have to say thank you for. Uh, Joe in my life, I have Tim Kernan in my life, Jason Dimitri, these older people really carried the map for me. Okay. They're the ones that had to go through the difficult pain. They're the ones that had to bring me to Jesus. Now, I didn't do any of that. They carried my map. Oh my That's the thing we have to remember. Someone carried our map. So we got to be willing to carry somebody else's map. Yeah. See, Jesus did not call the unbelievers to us. They called us to the unbelievers. It later says in this verse, in verse 5, it says, because of their faith. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just his faith. It was because of their faith. Yeah. Yes, your faith can directly result in your salvation. That's true. Mm -hmm. But when's the last time your faith directly resulted in someone else's salvation? When, is, when did your faith directly result in someone else's salvation? And we see here, going out and saving the lost is not just a skill issue. Oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. It's a faith issue. Yeah. It's all about faith. Mm. See, when we have faith like this, there is no end of the line. There is no, I tried hard enough. I did enough. That is, it's all too important. See, when these guys, they, they, they'd gone too far. They had given too much that they were going to get him to Jesus no matter what. See, what was the first problem that they had? Well, the first problem is that they couldn't make it past the door. Right? They would have explained their noble cause to the people and the crowd around them, and yet nobody moved. There would have been some that tried to move. Oh, sorry, I can't move. You know, there's too much room. I, they, they blamed other people. There have been some, have you ever done this when you were in line? and you pretend like you can't move anywhere, I'm sorry, I got no room, you know? <laughs> that, that would have been something like that in the crowd. They could move, they just, they just really don't want to. Amen, we've been there. But there have been totally others that just totally ignored them, yeah. right? And then, okay, well, that's the first problem. Some of us would just be like, okay, well, I guess that's it. We tried hard enough, we carried it all the way here, we just can't get inside. But you would think that they would have started looking at you, panting, what could we done? We carried them here, we have to do something. Start looking up at the roof. <laughs> we can do it. Are you sure, man? No, I'm, I'm kind of tired. No, man, I think we can do it. We can get up on the roof. Let's go. Yeah. Carrying them up there. And then some people, again, would have been uh, mocking them. Yeah. What are they doing? Why are they bringing them up on the roof? How are they going to get them down? What, what are they doing? These guys are crazy, mm -hmm. right? There, some people would have walked by and said, man, we should probably help them. Uh, no, nah, that, that's, 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 there's no point in helping them right there. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is, we have to see here that too many of us, when we're bringing people to Jesus, we quit on the ground. Come on, Sean. We don't think, okay, i got to get to my next level now. Uh, yeah. We just quit on the ground. Wow. And it's true because 
There's sometimes people say, man, it's impossible. I can't get them to Jesus. Yeah, that, that's kind of true for you, but only because of where you stand. You've got to get to the next level. You've got to change something. You've got you to find a different position. Yeah. It's the same exact thing. We have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to go to the next level for you? You know, I, I love what the sisters in our church actually did this past weekend. We didn't plan it or anything. The sisters just went out and they had an all-night prayer. Oh. And uh, so this Friday night, I know Millie kind of kick-started it off. And some other sisters came and joined her. And they met up, I think, at 12 o'clock at night and went all the way. Some went to 3 a.m., some went to 6 p.m. And they just went out praying. They're like, hey, we want to do some things in our life, and we need to go to the next level. Yeah. We're not waiting for somebody to give us direction. I didn't tell them to do that. And they just went out praying. we got to change something in our heart. Mm -hmm. See, guys, I know for us brothers, I'm like, dang it, well, we're still in the bottom level. Okay, I, I look at that, I'm like, all right, guys, we got to get to level three. What is that? You know, let's take the elevator. I don't know. We got to get there somehow. But I'm like, okay, what are we going to do to get to the next level? See, there's going to be issues in the church. Amen. Um, for us as a church, we're praying to have 72 visitors next week. And uh, as we look around and we see, okay, hey, we don't have that many people in the church as comparison of what we want next next week. Amen. These guys came up to a problem. We came up to a problem as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to look at it and get discouraged? No. We need to get to the next level. Yeah. That's the only difference. Those who quit on ground or go to the next level. See, now they would have got up there and problem number two. Now what? <laughs> they got to the roof. And I don't know if you've ever had a great plan, but once you actually arrived here, you're like, dang, now what do we do, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing. They're like, dang, now, now what do we, we, why don't we come to the roof? And then they were like, okay. Let's break in. Are you serious? Yeah, man, we gotta do something. Let's break on in. You would think, like, what are they doing? Did they just do that? There would have been a surprise from people in the house. They would have started, like, seeing little dirt coming from the roof. Jesus would have been speaking and would have hit his shoulder. Like, and, then, and then the roof starts falling in. And they're like, no problem, no problem. And they let down the guy with the mat. Like, are you crazy? Like, of course we're crazy. We're just like what Paul says later on in, 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 the, in, in the Bible, right? If I'm crazy or out of my mind, I'm doing it for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing what we need to do. Sometimes we, we, we stop because we hit a hard place. Mm -hmm. We stop and we think the excuse, I don't know what to do, is good enough. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough. You do something. We hit a hard place because the person that we're trying to help, they don't want to have faith. That's hard. We can't. It's a hard heart right there. We don't, we don't know what to do. We need a hard place because we don't know how to actually get them to start praying, get them to start reading. Do something. Yeah. See, what are barriers that you are too scared to break through? Yeah. There have been some people that heard that idea break through the roof. Man, that's crazy. What are you talking about? But they did it, and that, that person got to his blessing because of it. Mm -hmm. Guess what, though? Whatever barrier that you're scared to break through for in them, uh, with them and in their hearts, they're scared to break through it as well. Yeah. But them having you doing, uh, doing it with you makes it a little bit easier. To be honest, if I was one of those four guys and only me just doing it, that would be kind of scary. But if I saw my other three companions start like, all right, whatever, is he's doing it, let's all do it then. That, 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 would, that would encourage me. Yeah, yeah. One would have had to start, but others would have jumped in there with me. Right. Yeah. See, I, I think about this and I read this story and I'm like, well, I wonder if this man even cared if he, if he got to the blessing at the end. I wonder if, if by the time that they're up on the roof, that he would have just been so moved by the display of love. He's like, I don't even care if I walk away walking now. I could be paralyzed for the rest of my life, but these guys showed me such deep love. Come on, Sean. Right? How would have you felt? If you've been cared. They see that you can't get in the door. They take you to the roof. They start busting through the ground. And you'd be like, no, please don't make too much emotion. It doesn't matter. Shh. Boy, we're getting you to Jesus. Yeah. This guy would have been moved in his heart. Yeah. Sometimes it's not even just about the blessing and them getting their lives changed. It's, it's like, what about your display of love? Yeah. When's the last time your great display of love got someone thinking, man, did they just do that for you? Yeah. I, I'm moved by that. I, I'm so moved that he probably started to get faith as well, right? He, he probably in the beginning would have been fighting this, but by this time it's like, Maybe Jesus can really heal me. Yeah. Maybe he can. If they're doing this so much, maybe there's something to it. Mm -hmm. 
When has your love resulted in someone's faith? Yeah. That's how great our love must be. See, great things happen in our lives when we're unwilling to settle. Come on, we're unwilling to just give up where God has put us. See, at the end of the day, though, it's kind of funny that these guys got the best seats in the house. Yeah. They would have gave it up and sacrificed that in the beginning, but at the end of the day, man, they got the best seats. Yeah. So my first and my third challenge here, guys, is, is have a great gesture of love this week. Come on, Sean. Something that's going to bring down the roof in someone's life. Yeah. Something that's going to get other people to ask that question, what did they just do? Now, point number four, and coming to a close, the working Christ. Oh, Let's see how the story ends, guys. Verse 5 through 14, uh, through 12. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, meaning, who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was, uh, excuse me, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? To say this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive his sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone, and, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I really love how this story ends. This is one of those Disney good stories. has a great ending right here. It talks about, first of all, that Jesus knew what was going on in their hearts. Yeah. Jesus knew what was scheming in their hearts and, their, and their, their, their wickedness and their complaints and everything. Why is he saying this? And yet, that didn't stop Jesus from doing some miracles right here. But what's awesome is he goes on and explains what miracle just really happened right there. And which one was the better miracle? He says, hey, what's easier? To say that your sins are forgiven or to say it to a paralyzed man, take your mat and walk? What he really means by that, he's saying to say your sins are forgiven are so much harder. Mm -hmm. Taking up your mat, well, that's easy. Wow. God, God, God can easily do that. But to say that a sinner's sins are now forgiven... That's a true miracle. Wow. Mm -hmm. But just to show you that I can forgive sins, hey, take up your mantle. <laughs> now, that, 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 that's what Jesus was doing right here. And the thing is that it gets us to reflect back on our life. Sometimes we're looking for this miracle when we already received this one. Mm -hmm. and we don't have any gratefulness for it. Yeah. Do you realize and understand the miracle in your life so far? Come on, Sean. To have your sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. that, that's so much better than anything else. She said, that's the miracle to praise God about. But again, the crowd was praising him for all the wrong things. But I, I just saved this man. See, I, I know we're all very, very excited to witness Matt's um, uh, Matt baptism later on today. Uh, we're, we're so excited because that's going to be a miracle. Yeah. You know, even if he broke his leg on the way and he gets him magically healed over there, amen, that's going to be pretty cool to witness. Amen, not for you. But, but, but having his sins forgiven in the waters of baptism... That's a miracle, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an awesome benefit. That's why we're here. And the thing is that, that we have to understand that man, to have a sinner's, um, a sinner have his sins forgiven is the greatest miracle that God has ever done. Yeah. And so Jesus was realigning their hearts right there for a moment. But then he gets us to understand this, that, hey, they could have been disappointed when they lowered the, the guy down there. They could have been disappointed Hey, we brought them all here. What if Jesus reacted like a crowd? Where he saw the man getting lowered down and he gets mad. Why did you break the roof? Right. He could have reacted that way. Yeah. I was in the middle of my speech. That's disrespectful. Ooh. Might have reacted that way. Mm -hmm. He could have just ignored him like, like the whole crowd did. But we see here in the heart of God that when we are faithful to share, we can be assured that God is faithful to save. When we are faithful to share and bring people to God, God is going to be faithful to save them. See, God was glorified that day because a few people were willing to bring just one more soul to him. Come on, Sean. See, Jesus is still in the working business of saving souls. Yeah. But are we in the business of bringing souls to him? Come on. And just that one more. 
That's all we need. See, great things, and just coming up to a conclusion, great things are starting to happen in the church, but we cannot settle. Right? We're, we're praying for even next week that we're going to have these 72 people come on in the church. We're having an awesome baptism today. And some of us can feel, oh, okay, now it's time to rest. No, no, no. Now it's time to work, guys. Because yeah. now we're, we're trying to get closer to those miracles. Yeah. See, we cannot have it. When we, we want to see those great things, we cannot settle where we are. Yeah. See, our desire to share much, excuse me, our desire to share our faith, faith must match God's desire to save. Mm -hmm. Come on, John. That must be our desire when we go out and share our faith. Because we see here by the end of the story in Mark chapter 2, verse 13, that, that Jesus wasn't settling. It says here, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. That Jesus over and over and over was giving his heart and his love and willing to save people. Here they come again. Another crowd coming. Another people that just want to be healed. But Jesus wasn't done working, and we are not done working as well. Come on. See, it's awesome. We're going to be able to see Matt and his baptism and enter the kingdom of God this afternoon. But Woo! guess what? We're not done. Yeah. There's going to be another Matt. There's going to be another Pascal. There's going to be another Sephora. And they're out there waiting for us, guys. Come on. Yeah. They're out there waiting for us yeah. to grip our teeth, pick up their Matt, not waiting for them to start walking looking at ourselves and saying, what am I going to do about their salvation? Yeah. And once we do that, guys, and we look throughout this story, and just like friends, we can start asking, who am I? Yes. <laughs> am, am I the crowd? <clears throat> Amen. If you're the crowd, you need to start working. Come on, Sean. Am I the cripple? Amen. If you're the cripple, hey, we want to help you. I encourage everybody who always comes to church. We want to study the Bible with you. We want to yeah. help you. We want to get into your life and help you see that parts of your life that you feel like can't be healed can be healed and if you're part of the cripple. Or do, do you need to be called to be part of the companion? Amen. We'll never be the savior that works. Okay. Amen. That's Christ's, Christ's job. But yeah. we've got to see which one are we. Yeah. I just want to encourage everybody. Let's all be the companions that are bringing people to the working Christ. Thank you very much. Woo!